Welcome back to the Bible, day 40. No excuses with God. In a journey of faith, embracing accountability and steadfastness becomes paramount. And Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19, teaches the importance of obeying God's guidance and resisting excuses that may lead astray. Equally, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 46, Jesus demonstrates unwavering commitment, urging followers to stay vigilant without justification. And Exodus chapter 4 through Exodus chapter 6, verse 12, reinforces the notion that God equips us, eliminating the need for excuses. In these passages, a resounding message echoes. No excuses are, are needed when walking hand in hand with God, named the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to ask the Lord. And now we're going to ask the Lord. Ask the Lord to shine into our hearts, O lovely Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge. And open up the eyes of our mind that we may understand your teachings and scriptures. Help us to apply what we learn to your having conquered sinful desires. We may pursue the spiritual way of life, thinking and doing all the things that are pleasing to you. In Christ, of God, you are of light, and to you will be glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever, the sages. Amen. The Lord is our shepherd. All right, good evening. Welcome back. So great is his faithfulness. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Christ is truly in our midst. The true definition of minister is to serve someone else's will. My pleasure to bring you all God's word each and every day. So our first reading from wisdom, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Get our screen shared over. Get right to it. Thank you all again for following. All right, here we go. All set up, ready to go. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. We'll get zoomed in. Here we go. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it says, listen, my son, accept what I say. And the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to an Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot rest until they do evil. For they are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19, imparts profound spiritual teachings, improvising the significance of embracing wisdom and righteousness. The passage begins by urging readers to take hold of my words with all your heart. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 4, improvising the need for wholehearted commitment to God's guidance. It unfolds with an analogy of the path of the righteous likened to the sunrise, growing brighter until the whole, the whole light of day. This illustrates the progressive illumination of understanding and righteousness in one's life journey. Parallel to biblical themes, this mirrors the unfolding revelation of God's plan and the growth of faith. In verse 14, do not set foot on the path of the wicked. Or walk in the way of evildoers. So it's introducing a cautionary note. Warning against entering the path of the wicked. This aligns with biblical parallels such as Psalms 1. Which contrasts the ways of the righteous and the wicked. The message here is clear. Align with God's wisdom and righteousness. And avoid the pitfalls of what simple paths. 
the heart of the passage lies in verses 16 through 19. For they cannot rest until they do evil. For they are robbed to sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. So the heart of the passage lies in those verses, highlighting what the wicked's inability to sleep unless they do evil and cause others to what stumble. Right? This underscores the destructive nature of a life to void. This underscores the destructive nature of the life of God's wisdom. The teaching is clear. Excuses cannot justify immoral actions or wandering from God's paths. In serving God, one must stand firm against all wickedness, recognizing the consequences it brings. So Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19, it serves as a timeless guide, urging believers to embrace God's wisdom. Stay on the path of righteousness and reject excuses from deviating from what his, his plan, his path. It resonates with the broader biblical narrative, right? improvising the continual pursuit of God's light and the importance of unwavering commitment in the face of what? Temptation. All right. So our New Testament reading, Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 46. Jesus predicts Peter's denial in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on the account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on the account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Guess me. Then Jesus went with disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And, be, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup taken from me yet not as i will but as I will then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping could you men keep watch with me for one hour he asked peter watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation the spirit is willing but the flesh weak. he went on a second time and prayed my father that it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it. May your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left, so he left them and went away once more and prayed for the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, You are still, you're still sleeping and resting. Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So here in Matthew 26, it captures a pivotal moment in Jesus' life. Conveying profound spiritual teachings on commitment, prayer, <clears throat> and overcoming challenges. This passage unfolds in the context of Jesus predicting Peter's denial and the events leading up to his arrest. In verses 31 through 35, 
Jesus foretells Peter's denial, improvising the fatality of human community. Here, the spiritual teaching highlights the need for self-awareness and reliance on God's strength rather than personal confidence. It serves as a warning against overconfidence, an example of our tendency to fall short despite good intentions. Yes. In verses 36, 38, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus reveals Jesus reveals himself as vulnerable, right? Expressing his anguish to what? To the disciples. This underscores the importance of honest communication with God, right? Showing that even Jesus saw comfort and strength through what? Prayer. It sets an example for believers to turn to God in distress without making excuses for being vulnerable. It's beautiful. I think so. Verses 39 through 41. Jesus' prayer demonstrates total submission to God's will, showing us a profound spiritual teaching on what surrender. Despite the agony, Jesus acknowledges God's plan without making what excuses for his discomfort. This echoes the sentiment of the Lord's prayer. Your will be done on earth as it as it is in heaven. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. Verses 42 through 46. Jesus returns to find the disciples asleep and addresses them with a call to what? Watch and pray. This highlights the spiritual teaching of vigilance and persistence in serving God. Disciples' drowsiness is the classic example of the consequences of spiritual tiredness. Right? They were tired. Biblical parallels include Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, as Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, improvising reliance on God's word and parallels with the Lord's prayer, improvising submission to God's will. Overall, Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 46, underscores the importance of humility, honest communication with God, surrender to his will, vigilance and avoiding excuses, and our journey for serving God faithfully. In the name of the Father. Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. Our Old Testament reading. Exodus chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We'll read to Exodus chapter 6, verse 12, where we'll stop. All right. So here we go. Exodus. Signs for Moses. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Moses answered. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is it? What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out, took a hold of the snake, turned it back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe. That the Lord, the God of their fathers, and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand aside, your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak. And when he took out, his skin was leprous. and had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak. He said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. The Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your, your servant, Lord. I've never been elegant. I've never been elegant, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak. and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please. And send someone else. The Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? 
I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak, and I will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if your mouth and as if you and as if you were God to him. But take it, but take the staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Moses returned to Egypt. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took, this, he took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform. See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart and he will not let the people go. Then say to the Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses, who was about at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zephora took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said the bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron everything that the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders, the Israelites. And Aaron told them everything the Lord said to Moses. He also performed a sign for the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Bricks without straw. Exodus. Exodus chapter 5. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. The Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave his order to the, to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go get your own straw wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble and use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required for you for each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelites and overseers they had appointed, demanding, why haven't you met the quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy. That's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get your work. We will not be you will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. 
the Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they when they were told. You are not to reduce the number of bricks required for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials have not put us and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. God promises deliverance. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you've sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on his people. And you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he, he will let them go. Because of my because of my mighty hand, he will drive, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by but by but by my name the Lord I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I will give it to you as possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their, their disencouragement and harsh labor. The Lord said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with flattering lips? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, so back to Exodus 4. So, what we've read kind of narrates Moses' encounter with God, right? Highlighting spiritual teachings on obedience, trust, and the rejection of, of, of excuses in serving God. So in Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. So 1 through 17. God provides miraculous signs to reassure Moses of his power. Moses' initial reluctance re represents what human doubts. But God improvises that he equips those he calls. This teaches that serving God requires trust. And God's empowerment can overcome excuses rooted in self-doubt. Moses also what raised some objections, didn't he? Expressing what his shortage, right? He, had, well, he wasn't very good at speech. You know? I'm kind of like Moses. I'm not, I don't have very good speech either. You know? So God responds by assuring his presence and providing Aaron as a helper. Spiritual teaching here is that God addresses our insecurities. And objects, he, he, God addresses our insecurities and our objections. Improvising that he equips and accompanies us. God's provision counters, counters excuses grounded in personal what, limit, limitations. As we finish up. Exodus chapter 4, Moses returns to Egypt. So Moses departs from Egypt, highlighting the obedience. Okay? The obedience required in serving God. Heeding God's call means overcoming personal reservations. The, this mirrors biblical parallels such, such as Abraham's obedience. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. When Abraham was tested. And also Jesus' submission to the Father's will. That was in our reading tonight. Matthew chapter 26, verse, verse 39. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Not as I will, but as you will. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, 
All right, so Exodus chapter 5 through Exodus chapter 6, verse 12. The initial resistance. So the initial, the, the initial resistance and God's response. So Moses faces resistance from Pharaoh, leading to what increased hardships for the Israelites. Right? The spiritual teaching is that obedience to God may bring some challenges, and it will. But trusting in him amid difficulties is very crucial, it's vital, right? Excuses based on external obstacles should not deter one from serving God faithfully, right? God reaffirms his covenant, right? So God reaffirms his covenant promises. He promises deliverance. Spiritual teaching emphasizes God's faithfulness despite human shortcomings. Excuse is rooted in past failures or uncertainties or counted by God's unwavering commitment to his people. Biblical parallels include Jonah's. When Jonah's reluctance, right? Remember when Jonah, this, yeah, Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Jonah flees from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, his son at Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness had come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for tar Tarnish. He went down to Joppa and where he had found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarnish to flee from the Lord. Even in, uh, there's another example in Judges. Get myself out of the way here. Judges, chapter 6, talking about Gideon's doubts. Right? So in Judges, chapter 6, verse 11 through 18, the doubts of Gideon, highlighting how God's addresses excuses and calls in individuals to obedient service. Beautiful. So in summary, right? So go back to Exodus. So in summary, Exodus chapter four, verse one through Exodus chapter six, verse 12, teaches that serving God requires trust, obedience, and a rejection of excuses. God equips, addresses objections, and remains faithful, urging believers to overcome self-doubt and external challenges and their faith, and their journey of faith, the path of Christ. So we'll end in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you all again for following. All right. Close out with a blessing. All right. So that's day 40. The day 40 is a wrap. Thank you all again for following. And hope you're all learning a lot more about the Bible. I know I am. I learned with you all, right? So we learn together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, how that be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. To forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yours is the kingdom, power, glory, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. The sages. Amen. Depart in peace, in the name of the Lord, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Peace be with you all. Go in peace. Shalom, shalom. May the Lord forgive those who love us and those who hate us. I love you all so much. I'm out. Have a blessed evening.